So I'm really grateful to our keynote speaker, Heather Autone, to carve out time from her very demanding schedule to speak to us today. Her discussion, Shifting the Paradigm, A Love Story, is sponsored specifically by the University of Virginia Mellon Indigenous Arts Initiative. Dr. Heather Auton is Chickasaw and Choctaw. She serves as senior curator of First Americans Museum here in Oklahoma. Based in Norman, Oklahoma, she earned her doctoral degree from the University of Oklahoma. In the past, she served as assistant um, curator of non Native American and non-Western arts at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art. And she's independently curated many wonderful exhibitions with catalogs. So please join me today in welcoming Heather Auton. Um, thank you to First American Art Magazine. Um, thank you to America Meredith for the invitation to speak today. I've often said that America is one of the smartest people I know and I'm so grateful for her friendship and her, for, for her vision for our community. Her invitation for me to speak to you today is an extension of our relationship and our mutual respect, two topics I'm going to return to again in a bit. With gratitude, I accepted the invitation and I'm honored that the University of Virginia has sponsored it. Thank you for the encouragement and support. With a deep sense of humility, I'm here to dis deliver my remarks and to do my best at it. Perhaps most importantly, thank you to those of you who've joined today for making time for what I believe to be a critically timed conversation. My name is Heather Autone. I am a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation and descended from a long line of beautiful Choctaw women. I'm speaking today from Norman, Oklahoma, where the Wichita and affiliated tribes and the Caddo people have ancestral history. Today, I live just across the river from the Chickasaw Reservation, a space upon which my ancestors laid a foundation for our cultural survival after being forcibly removed from our homelands that extended into Tennessee, Mississippi, Kentucky, and Alabama. It is through their diligent care and hard work, their faithfulness to the gifts given to us by our creator that I'm able to bring these words to you. It is absolutely a truth that I, like you, are an answer to my ancestors' prayers. This knowledge is a source from which I work to build a future for our descendants. I want to be a good ancestor. My work is an expression of love for my ancestors, my community, my culture, and for the gifts that I have been given. My goals are to create a strong future for my tribal community, and by extension, other indigenous communities as well. It is through the strength gifted to me by my ancestors that I ambition to create space for indigenous American cultures and philosophies and art within museums. As a curator, my focus is upon the presentation and to a great extent, the interpretation of objects, images, and stories. The, the path that's brought me here today has been interwoven with a series of adventures that have had me thinking about the issues at hand. How do we prioritize indigenous principles in our words as we care for, exhibit, and write about indigenous arts? For me, that is grounded in my work in museums, but the question remains the same in whatever capacity you have been brought to this conversation and in whatever capacity you serve our indigenous communities. Whether you are indigenous by descent or not, if you are working with indigenous materials, arts, images, you have a assumed a responsibility to the indigenous communities. While you may or may not have come to this work with a knowledge of our indigenous principles, serving our community requires that you familiar yourself with our cultures, our protocols, and building relationships with us. Without us, you will never fully benefit from the love that is carried by these materials. How do we prioritize our indigenous principles as we care for, exhibit, and write about indigenous arts? This is a serious question, and to consider it, I remain quite reflective on what I know about the field, our history, and our future. To find my way through this contemplation, I can see that the path is being laid before us, or perhaps more accurately, the path has always been there. It is part of the original teachings that were gifted to our indigenous communities in the beginning. To help you understand my thinking, I'd like to share briefly a bit of my personal history and apologies to those who have heard this before, but I believe it'll be critical to share through my personal anecdotes where the field was when I began so that I can provide the context for where I believe we are and most critically where I propose that we can go. This story begins in 1993, right after I graduated from the Institute of American Indian Arts Creative Writing Program. I had supported myself I, I, for anyone, for, by writing for anyone that would publish my work. 
Through this effort, I gained some confidence in my capacity to write. And after graduation, I found myself scooping ice cream at the Santa Fe Plaza haagen Cafe. How many of you have stopped in there during Indian Market to get a ca cappuccino or a sandwich? Scooping ice cream paid the rent, and I've never been too proud to do whatever work paid the rent. And one day, this tall native fellow came in and waited for me to take his order. I wasn't really sure who he was. Luckily, he wasn't there to order a scoop of chocolate, but rather offered me a job to write for the IAI Museum. As the museum director, Paul Rainbird had been following my work as a student, and he had a vision for what could become an indigenous voice for the museum's public relations. You're probably going to laugh, but I really thought I was clever negotiating my pay from the four seventy-five an hour I made scooping ice cream to the $7 an hour I was going to earn writing for the museum. But that was big money for me at the time. And most importantly, though, it was priceless upon reflection, was that this was my introduction to the interior workings of a museum and where the field was in the early 1990s. I could not have imagined what opportunities lay before me as an indigenous writer and thinker. After jumping right into the job at the museum to help install an exhibition of Arctic art, my first writing assignment was to prepare the PR for an exhibition of Lawrence Paul Yuck's Wolupton's art. I fell in love with his paintings, how culturally astute they were. As I looked at his paintings, I could see the direct assignment of personhood to the trees and the use of the form line motifs of the Northwest coast applied to personify, but not humanize the landscape. As I researched what had been written about his work, I was stymied. In 1993, his work was fully encapsulated within the references to surrealism. Sure, there was an active intentional distortion of the Western reality one might look for within the paintings, but it was not a suggestion of imagined or illogical imagery. Rather, I wanted to find someone to give me the language to use to express his application of Coast Salish philosophies and the relationships bound between the dynamic life forms of the trees, the landscape, the mountains, and the humans. His imagery for me was a highly evolved philosophical commentary on the environment not an unconscious strangeness. But despite months of research, I couldn't find the words. I couldn't find the words because they had not been written yet. I prepared something, but quite honestly, I was a little heartbroken that I couldn't do better for his art. From that exhibition, it became my practice to read everything I could on whatever indigenous artist I was trying to understand through their art, including reading about their cultures in all the fields. And through the next series of exhibitions, I continued to read everything I could find in the library, the bookstore, anywhere, but the words I was seeking remained hidden. It was at this point that it became clear to me that I couldn't, what I couldn't find may not have been published yet. And while there were already many amazing books to read and learn, what I was looking for were answers to questions that had not yet been asked of museums and galleries. And in fact, this gave me a courage that I want to share with you. What I came to realize that, is that there is a gap, a canyon. On one side, what the Euro-American paradigm of art history and cultural studies can offer to interpret about the artists that our indigenous people make. On the other side of that canyon lays what indigenous communities understand about the same art. What did this understand, me, understanding mean for me then? I saw that canyon both deep and wide like the Grand Canyon but I also saw and still see an opportunity. I see that canyon as one for which we can all create a bridge. I believe that we can build a bridge of respectful understanding to share indigenous cultures by the contributions of so many good minds. I saw then what I see now, that while I may not be the best writer or the smartest thinker, that every contribution to that gap is needed. What I can say now, is that every time I write, every exhibition catalog or textbook to which I contribute, for me, continues to be the effort to fill that canyon. So in a manner of speaking, every publication I write is a pebble, and one day the gap will be filled by the accumulation of pebbles that become a bridge. And that vision has given me a purpose and a freedom. Because a pebble may not seem like much, my pebble doesn't have to be perfectly round or suit anyone else, that it still will help fill the gap but the canyon will not be filled by the work of any one person because any of us are only just crafting pebbles. But if we craft each pebble as best we can, and this is all that the creator asks of us, we will make a difference. 
And when I think of these pebbles, they are both a relief and a truth for no person should take on the burden to build that bridge alone. And consequently, for whatever we do, we can only do our best. We can imagine together that the canyon will be filled by the efforts of the collective's best, including those of you gathered today and more. I don't even believe that the contributions will come only from indigenous people, as there are many non-indigenous folks who are doing good work and helping to cast their own pebbles into that same canyon. What is becoming clear for me now almost 30 years later is that while any culturally sensitive person working with a good heart can contribute their own pebble, that the paradigm of Euro-American heart history and writing is like sand and will not provide the concrete foundation upon which this bridge can be formed. As I say this, I caution you from casting judgment on the field's evident weaknesses. Think of that sand as small, tiny pebbles and be grateful for each one that has brought us together today. That sand has laid a foundation and will eventually become the concrete as we add the water of our indigenous life. But for that concrete to support a river, we also need to provide some anchors to guide the flow. So it is time for us to collectively build some boulders. We need to shift the tide of the stream to allow for an indigenous voice that provides leadership on how the canyon can become transformed to support our mutual benefit. We can look to the great indigenous thinkers who have already brought us here today. There have been the philosophers, Dagana Wida, the peacemaker, Vine Deloria, John Trudell, George Horsecapture, Fred Cabote, Cecil Dick. There have been the visionaries, Red Jacket, Tinsquatawewa, Lewis Ballard, Alan Hauser, Shan Gosshorn, and there have been the warriors, Tecumseh, Little Turtle, Tishamingo, Will Rogers, Maria Martinez, T.C. Cannon, Suzanne Shonharjo, Linda Tuhiwe Smith, and Casey Camp Pornick, and so many more among them. They have left us a legacy in the boulders of their work. Their legacy comes from the strength of our ancestral teachings and this is what we must do. We need to turn to our original teachings to find these boulders, and they will serve as anchors from which we can reach out and guide the flow of the information in this stream. These boulders can shift the paradigm to allow for our ancestors through the gifts that they have given us to guide our path forward. But it's perhaps worth thinking for a moment of where the field has been. Recently on February 18th, Ruth Phillips provided an excellent overview on the paradigms that have brought us to this moment in her remarks for the panel hosted by the Met. She reminded me of the sequence that our arts and cultural materials have survived, waiting for us to come together in our work today. They survived the salvage paradigm of the 19th century, the primitivism paradigm of the early 20th century, and the then commonly established African Oceanic American paradigm in the mid 20th century. That last paradigm is where all the people of color are combined into a hegemonic lump of non-whiteness. And Dr. Phillips went on to discuss the emergence of an indigenous voice and the artisans or interventions in the 21st century. I find it helpful to remember these paradigms, to remember because we can see from this that it has only been a brief time that our indigenous hearts have been subjects of serious Western consideration. I think about the Cooper site bison skull found in Western Oklahoma that is at least 13,000 years old. The oldest inscribed object located in the America, North America. And we know that the evidence of our indigenous presence and philosophies and knowledge extends before that. So you can see that while we have been making visual culture for millennia, it has only been about 150 years that our indigenous arts have been assigned a value to organize them within the project of colonialism. Some of our indigenous communities, our tribal cult materials were being collected during early contact. I am quite aware, Choctaw and Chickasaw cultural materials that were stolen away to Europe during the 16th century as a form of war trophies. But we cannot confuse the brief period of contact with external dominant forces with the epic from which we draw strength. Our indigenous ancestors have been making, expressing our cultures, setting our path forward for so much longer. It is our way of making the world to make things with our hands, containing the wisdom of our philosophies, expressing our gratitude for being alive. And while we have a continuum of making, the valuation of our artistic endeavors is very recent. I would ask you to consider then 
that the historic paradigms, salvage, primitivism, AOA, they have surpassed their appropriateness. We might say their use by date has now expired. And what I see is that with the increased number of indigenous folks contributing to the conversation, that these paradigms will never be able to get at a deeper reading of the art. And so we are gathered today because we all see this. And this is where my story reveals itself to be a love story, because I want to share that deeper reading of our indigenous arts. I love our indigenous cultures. I love the way that our humanity is connected to the stars, to the earth, to the natural cycles and the seasons. I love the way that we have learned how to be humans by centuries of observation of the natural world, learning from the animals, the water, the sky, and the smallest of creatures, including the ants. And this love is at the root of our arts and our cultural materials. So I love our arts. And it is because of that deep love that I simply expect that we do better because the artists are putting that same love into their work. The artists are making amazing art. They are investing their best creative energy to carry that love and knowledge into new forms and continued customary practices. We must do better as a field writing of this same work. We cannot sit back and relax into the comforts of allowing Western culture to hold the dominant hand in guiding our work with these same indigenous creative works. But the knowledge that is needed has not existed in the books. It remains largely grounded within the indigenous communities, within our philosophies, within our original teachings. And because of that, I believe that the field needs to turn to the indigenous people who are working in the field and within the collections as scholars and curators and collections managers. Our indigenous community members have to think outside of the walls of our institutions and look to our cultural knowledge to support a new paradigm. We have been brought to this moment and now we must stand up. Ask our ancestors for the strength and the vision to act and pray that our work will serve a benefit to the unborn. We must stand in this space as an extension of trust by those who cannot stand for themselves. As I mentioned before, the invitation to speak to you is also an extension of trust. I have approached the preparation of these remarks with an intent to think about the role of trust as we, the collective we, you and me, and all those who are thinking about indigenous American art as we begin to explore what needs to be done for the field. You are likely here because you have found, like many of us, that the methods for critically discussing indigenous art are incomplete. Like I felt in the 1990s that the words did not exist. I am not restating the old concept of how we do not have words for art. First American Art Magazine has proven that as a full on cop out. I am saying that how we think about how we work with and what we do on behalf of the communities represented by the collections in the museum requires that we step forward and create the vocabulary, create the frameworks for reaching into the deeper richness of our indigenous arts. As indigenous people, we must look to our ancestral teachings and pray for work towards and convict ourselves to formulate the paradigm to which we go next. To move forward, we should reflect critically on what has been given us, act in gratitude, and recognize where each of us as individuals can move forward and contribute to the field. For me, this has meant that some of what I have been taught through school and through working in museums doesn't support the discussion that is needed. The categories are frail and cannot support the weight of the knowledge held in the art, that the boxes inhibit the dynamic of the cultures, often restricting the temporal bounds for the discussion. They continue to employ stifling parameters tied to the boxes of historic or contemporary. The current paradigm doesn't support the capacity between cultures, between people, and between broader geographic spaces. There are relationships that exist between the designs, between the materials. We know this to be true. We know that the objects have a life and are an important part of our cultural continuum. The art reflects our relationships, our cultural exchanges, and the reciprocity of sharing. The art reflects the respect that we have for our unique identities while also happily reflecting our friendships. However, we are crippled by the shallow published record and the baby talk so often used in discussing the art. The artists deserve more, the cultures deserve more, and the art deserves more. We have recognized that European philosophies did not make this art. 
And we are clearly at a place where we recognize that European philosophies are insufficient to categorize and interpret indigenous art. If we are being further truthful, we also can see that continued application of Euro-American Euro perspectives further contributes to the trauma of indigenous communities as our cultural philosophies remain separated from our arts. So how do we move forward? When I asked America what she wanted me to discuss, she asked me to discuss my methodology as an introduction to one perspective on how to move forward. That caught me a little off guard, not because I don't think my methodology is worth discussing, but because I realized I have two methodologies and both are works in progress. I say that because I continue to use them and my thinking about them continues to grow and shift and become more precise in my own personal understanding. So I'm going to talk through briefly my curatorial methodology for which I have received significant interest. This is an important point about the practice of action. And then I'll come back to my research methodology. So my curatorial methodology has been the basis for my work for over a decade. First Americans Museum is the first place where I have worked that the core tenants have been embraced as an institutional approach. Using the four R's found in the methodologies of indigenous research, we are working with tenants guided by our indigenous cultures and philosophies. These are critical because they teach us how to be in the world, not just as tribal citizens and cultural people, but as humans and as professionals. Using these four R's at FAM, we have decolonized the museum from the top down, developing our institutional plans with the majority native staff of over a dozen professionals. Our methodology is team-based collaboration. Using these core tenets of indigenous methodologies, we work with respect for people, for one another. We work with respect for the knowledge that we are stewarding through our exhibitions and through our work with the communities. We work with respect for the aesthetics and the systems within each independent culture that mutually inform the materials that come from these cultures. We work with reciprocity. This is a practice that is at all levels of our work with tribes, with institutions, within the community, both native and non-native. We are building relationships, building concentricity within our community and building relationships with the objects and through the objects. We are carrying ourselves and holding ourselves accountable through our responsibility to the tribal knowledge, to the community members, to, to the donors and supporters who support our work. We are drawing inspiration and guidance from the wisdom of our ancestors to create exhibition concepts that celebrate our history and forge a path for our future through innovative and exploratorial curatorial practices. This methodology is activated by approaching all the challenges that arise through the work by coming back to these core tenants and checking on these tenants, how these tenants are being considered and cared for in all the decision making. As an example, if I'm having trouble getting a deadline met by a team member, I don't approach that conversation focused on the missed deadline. I approach it by checking on the person to better understand what is interfering with their capacity to meet the deadline. Taking care of the relationship and acting res with respect to their struggles, please know that I'm careful to refrain from imposing on their privacy or inserting myself into their issues. But through a discussion of the importance of our shared responsibility to meet that deadline, I can then take care of the team member and also strategize to meet our responsibility. This doesn't mean this isn't messy, complicated, and complex. But it might, means that at the end of the day, I work very diligently not to put my relationship with a colleague at risk because a project is suffering. Taking care of core tenants is also a method to project and our common goals. And these decisions require an active display of a common commitment to achieve with success with a project. So this is not a cookie cutter approach. It very much requires listening, speaking honestly, even using all of my senses to receive information. And it often requires me using the gifts given to me by the creator, including my intuition and empathic skills to recognize how I can guide the work being done by all involved. What I mean by this is that I use these core tenants when discussing projects with those on all sides of the hierarchy, above, below, and beside me. By caring for my relationships, acting with reciprocity, prioritizing my responsibilities, and doing so with respect, 
we are building a museum. And I use these core tenets when working through my research methodology. The framework that I have constructed for my research is the product of almost 30 years of working in the arts. I don't know how it will work for others, but I'm going to share the research methodology in case it may be helpful to you. It is my hope that I might be able to publish this in the next year. I've been hyper-focused on building a museum and unable to spare the creative energy to push this through to publication. So I'm going to share it now in case it helps you in any small way. I encourage you to consider, though, how this can be a guide for your work. Just please to take care to not let it become prescriptive. Quite frankly, I do not know how it will work in another person's hands, so I offer it here quite humbly. My research emerges out of the stories I've shared earlier and so many conversations with the artists, including people like Jerry Redcorn. I continue to seek the words that will express through writing the complex philosophies, the multivalent symbols and cues present in the contemporary indigenous arts. This thinking began in those early days at the II Museum. And after achieving my formal education, I found that the methodologies I learned may provide a way of approaching the art but they largely do not get us to the point of discussing indigenous cultures, indigenous aesthetic systems, and consequently, I have been left still wanting more. So my framework comes out of the work through the challenges I have already described. I had hoped I would find the answers to my questions and the words I needed by studying in the fields of art history, anthropology, and Native American studies. While these fields have informed my knowledge about methods and theories related to the interpretation of contemporary indigenous art, my emic knowledge of the culture informs me that there remains a missing framework to guide the analysis I want to be able to do. I arrived in my journey at a framework that incorporates an indigenous American cultural paradigm. This is important because interpretations without the cultures leaves information that the artist uses intentionally within the art absent from the analysis. I believe that there is value in bringing together methods from these academic disciplines in concert with indigenous methodologies to create a framework that will increase the interpretive value of the art and broaden the discourse around the objects and their roles as cultural mediators. This framework utilizes a four lens approach through which each object and artist is analyzed. So materiality. This lens considers what is being represented within, within the object and how the object becomes both a material embodiment of ideas while also becoming a generator of culture as an agent, participating in a continuum of cultural production using the same material or its referent in order to examine an object's materiality. You would ask questions into these just like this. What materials are being used? How are they being used? And are they direct or nuanced references to how these materials have been used historically when they, within the artist's cultural community? How does the artist integrate new materials? And what ontological references are being made, if any? What motivations have influenced this material? And does considering the materials from a culturally guided perspective provide broader intended or unintended meaning within the art? How is the object producing new culture? And by considering these questions, how the materials are intentionally used by the artist and how they perform a role to serve as a conduit for cultural knowledge will become evident. Metaphor and symbolism. Metaphor and symbolism is a lens that considers the semiotics of the designs, form, and overall composition. The role of semiotics is critical for an oral-based community, as knowledge was often coded into visual references that make specific reference to ceremony, natural sciences, and social mores. Questions guiding this inquiry include, what visual devices does the artist employ? What history exists for these designs? Is there a cultural history of using designs in a similar manner? What ontological philosophy is conveyed through the metaphoric and symbolic references? What intentions are conveyed as meaning through the use of metaphors and symbols? Are there unintended meanings being conveyed? And when multiple visual devices are employed, how does that enact a complex visual dialogue? Are there multiple me meanings being referenced? And if so, how do they contribute to the deeper reading of the art? By considering the complex use of metaphor and symbolism, the cultural relationships are carried across time, contributing to a continuum of knowledge and identity. And concentricity. 
Concentricity is a term coined by Dennis Martinez to express the importance of relationships within, indigen within an indigenous cosmology. Addressing their familial, tribal, animate and inanimate, human and non-human, spiritual and metaphysical relationships. Because relationships form cultural roles, ordering our social responsibilities, political hierarchy, our cer ceremonial ordinances. These must be explored beyond the familial and intellectual links. Questions that guide this inquiry include, what relationships are expressed through the object between the artist and his or her tribal community? With, is there a dialogue with other artists? And how is the object informed by ontological relationships with creation story figures and the artist? Does the artist draw kinship through the object to others? And if so, how? And what role do relationships have on the object? I have grown to think of concentricity as a vibration that activates the other lenses, though the relationships remain an important singular analytical lens. And temporality. As a creative individual, the artist is positioned within a time-space continuum that is informed by personal experiences as much as family and tribal history and works within a network of influences and possible materials. Certainly the importance of one's political position must be considered here as well. Other questions to consider include, what position does the artist enact through the object to history? What position does the artist enact through the object to the future? What influences contribute to the artist's interests in the construction of the object, personal, familial, tribal, national, global? What char characteristics of the object are positioned through the artist's personal, educational, and physical experiences? And what elements within the object relate it to historical cultural practices? And what elements within the object are delimited to a contemporary experience? Considering temporality allows the artist's position within the time-space continuum to be understood as both a product of and producer of culture and identity. Through the application of this analytical framework, the object can be examined as both a product of an artist's unique creative vision generated from an indigenous cultural perspective and enacting the potential for new indigenous cultural production. While existing methods have long been interested in the artist, the art, and its meaning, Indigenous American art is often left, dis often left disconnected from the broader cultural community. This analytical framework seeks to examine the relationships that are encoded through the application of ontological philosophical references by considering the artist selections of materials, their use of metaphor metaphors and symbolism, concentricity and relationships, and incorporating the artist's temporality. What you may have already recognized is that there is a mutual dependency between these lenses for seeing the Additionally, there is a fluidity between the object, the artist, and the culture as a mediator. The artist is responding to her culture and making the art, which then as a cultural expression becomes a source of culture and identity, both for the artist and the audience. By this consideration, the artist and the object are both producing and responding to the culture. So if we are looking to the, at the artists and the cultures, the framework I offer may be one path, but I have no doubt that there will be many paths to find truth for the art. Why am I so confident? Is because I follow Dr. Gregory Cajete's observation that truth is like a vortex. He writes, this moment when a truth comes to be intuitively known is like the still point in the eye of a hurricane. It is that point when a connection is made to a natural principle manifesting itself in the unfolding of a natural process. This is a precept of native science, for truth is not a fixed point, but rather an ever evolving point of balance, perpetually created and perpetually new. I don't know so much about hurricanes, but how these beings were formed in the hands of our people during the time of giants. How <clears throat> how they carry the parts of many, how they speak our language. Even better, I have a lifetime of knowing the tornadoes that dance across the landscape of Oklahoma. Dr. Cajete's observation resonates for me with regards to our topic today, because I think of a phenomenon of art that you may have witnessed. As an observer, I have seen folks come into contact with the same object and have very different responses, all valuable. It is because they each bring their own life force knowledge and philosophies into exchange with the object's life. And when these different responses are gathered together and compared, 
none becomes more or less true as an experience while the object remains the same. That is key here because this is part of the dynamic life of an object and the arts relationship to culture is also fundamentally the arts relationship to place. Wherever you are watching this conversation, you are on indigenous land. Those of you who work in museums have a responsibility to recognize that the objects in your care also develop a relationship to place through their travels. In this consideration of location, we must consider that the host cultures and local communities will need to be the starting point of any conversation for consultations. If the art has been brought on a journey away from the homelands, then consider that one would not go into a host's home and act disrespectfully. If you are at an institution and you are wondering how to start the conversation with the objects, then go to your local host indigenous community. Whether you are on ancient homelands or an urban intertribal space, begin to build the relationships with your local indigenous host. This will open the conversation by figuring out how to begin to know and understand the objects better. Because what you are trying to do, what you need to do is begin to build the relationships that are needed to find the words. There are relationships with the objects, relationships with the people, relationships with the culture, and all of these relationships are going to reveal truths. And these truths will begin to form a vortex that will carry our work forward. This vortex will begin to draw in the strengths of those who can help. The vortex will begin to expose the ones that you need. But if you do not seek the truth where you stand, how do you expect to see the truth anywhere else? This is one way to say that we are what we are seeking is not to build a wall or boxes or to establish a single framework. Remember that we are seeking to build a bridge that will allow the truth to travel and to be carried by the water we are going to release by doing better for the art. The vortex of truth is going to release the rain and as we have been taught, water is life. We are going to release the floodgates that have been established through the acts of imperialism and colonialism that have hurt us all. Having built a bridge across that canyon, we will find ourselves drenched in the sweat of the work and refreshed in the spray of the waters as they are released. That flow of water, that flow of knowledge, and the words we find will become the fluid life force that will support the vitality of our cultures. Your words are going to carry our cultures to far and distant places. Just as water has always carried our culture into new relationships, perhaps even renewing old relationships. The bridges to which we are all throwing our pebbles will connect us from this experience. The art will connect us with our original teachings, healing wounds and nurturing well-being. For us as indigenous people and for the European descendants, many of whom have lost their connections to their original tribal lands, and the stars and the water. If we seek a path into the future, for we have no place else to go as we cannot go back. As we lay a path into the future, we must do so connected to our original teachings, leading with love, respect, generosity, and taking care of one another. Thank you for listening to me. Um, I've prayed for the guidance to deliver comments that will resonate with you wherever you are and for our field as it stands today. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. May you each have a good day and be blessed through this symposium and as you continue your efforts to do your best. Chukmashki, thank you, and Chapisolacho, until I see you again. Thank you so much, Heather, for that wonderful keynote. Um, for the audience, I would love it if you can submit some questions into our Q&A. Meanwhile, I would like to invent invite Brendan to ask the first question if you're ready. Thank you, Taylor. And, and Heather, thank you very much for those beautiful words. It was extremely powerful and, um, uh, and uh, such a blessing to hear, hear words like that this morning. Very motivating for those of us, especially who are beginning this journey of writing about Indigenous art. Um, I just want to mention very quickly, uh, I'm, I'm joining you today from the ancestral homelands of the Monacan Nation, where I study at the University of Virginia uh, in the Department of Art there. I wanted to ask, um, because it's uh, something that's very uh, central to uh, my approach to, to research, your uh,
comments about creating the vocabulary necessary to discuss and write about indigenous art. And for those of us who are beginning or have non-indigenous heritages, it can be um, difficult to write with confidence uh, to, to really seek out those vocabularies. But toward the end of your speech or, or your presentation, one thing I noticed was this, this focus on finding the vocabulary through relationships, uh, with the relationships uh, from the art object, with the artist, with the land. And so I was hoping uh, you could talk a little bit more about that, about where you find um, these opportunities for, for creating a vocabulary and maybe even what role um, multilingualism could play uh, in, in scholarship whether that's an opportunity to sort of save some uh, indigenous languages? Well, that's a, a really good question. And I'm not sure my answer will be um, sufficient, really, quite frankly, because I think that's part of everything that we're gonna be talking about here today um, and tomorrow. But I think that um, I would encourage people, you, so I, you, you raised a couple of different points and I just wanna offer that, um, I've gone back and I look at some of the things that I wrote when I was just starting to write. And I'm not always horrified as much as one might expect because I know that in that moment, I really was doing my best. And so I try to forgive myself for um, you know, the lapses in uh, clarity. But I think the only way to become a better writer, the only way to become a better speaker is simply to do it. Um, anybody who has been a witness to my journey um, that I was referencing will know that um, speaking publicly is probably the thing that is the most challenging for me to do. And so I'm standing before you letting you know that this drives me nuts. Like I am shaking completely on the inside and I'm really proud of myself for not dissolving into tears or passing out. And the same can be said of the writing. One simply has to do it and one simply has to have the courage to try. You can't expect to come out of college and just because you've read other people's words, know how to put together the words that you need. And so I would encourage people to think about both having some confidence and taking the tasks that are offered to you, the opportunities that are given to you and to do your best with it. But then in the in-between spaces to listen and to go and listen to the things that people have to say, to go and ask questions. You know, for me to be able to summarize those words right now is the product of 30 years of listening to artists speak and knowing that with some confidence I can say these things. So those of you who are at the beginning of your careers, you really still have to go out and listen. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that that listening is not simply listening to professors. It's not simply listening to other people who are professionals in the field, although I'm not discouraging any of that, but it is to ask you to expand beyond that and to start going in and creating relationships within the indigenous communities from wherever you are. And also listening to the things that people have to say, listening even when you don't understand what they're saying and not pushing to try and get them to make it clear for you because some learning, some from an accumulation of exposure to that knowledge over time. And so in order to become a good writer, to become a good speaker, one has to learn how to be a good listener. And I will share with you very frankly, this is something that I still work really hard at. It's not something that for myself is still natural, both speaking or listening, because I'm very curious and I wanna ask lots of questions and asking those questions is helpful, but you're not trying to hear your own voice here. Thank you, Heather. Uh, before turning to a couple audience questions, I'd like to ask a bit of a personal one uh, that I was thinking about as you shared your sort of autobiographical um, elements, including scooping the ice cream, which is a story that I hadn't heard. And as someone who's sort of fresh out of grad school and has followed your work and so many of the other panelists, it's I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing to hear your humble beginnings and it encourages me that everything's gonna be okay. I can make it in this career. And I just wonder if you could take a moment to speak to the students who might be in the audience and sort of 
talk about how you find strength in your ability first starting out to, as you said, cast that pebble, right? What do you, what do, you do when you doubt yourself as a student or maybe imposter syndrome, things like that? How do you find strength? Hmm. Well, um, hmm. this comes out of a lot of prayer. It comes out of a lot of belief that um, the things that I've been taught personally through my family, but it also comes out of the renewal of doing the work and being a part of the conversation. So I think there's um, um, like, and Brendan, I didn't even come back to your multilingualism. I may come back to that in just a moment. But I think there is a necessary humility in what we're doing. And I think this is something that, um, this is not something that Academy fosters. This is something that I think actually the Academy works against. You have to speak like you know what you're talking about you know, um, when you're defending your theses, you have to act with a certain confidence that quite frankly, probably shouldn't exist, right? Like you've done some readings and maybe you have a, an idea that feels new to you, but you really can't know how that fits or where that falls. Nevertheless, that effort is part of that uh, cultivation of your capacity to speak with more confidence. And so you simply have to do the work. You simply have to go about it. And you cannot constantly judge yourself to the point of extinction, right? I have seen a lot of people do this. I have seen doctoral students and it kills me. It breaks my heart when they are so pressured from the academy to work in a manner where they are connecting with indigenous communities and then coming back and acting with confidence when they know that whatever they're doing is superficial. There's no way for it not to be that way as a young person. And so I think you just simply have to go out there and you just have to do it. And you have to just trust that if this is what you're being called to do, if this is where your path is opening up, if there is a place here that you feel like you can fill, then step into that space um, and just trust that you don't have to be expected to throw that boulder in. You're not being asked to be a boulder. You're simply being asked to cast in that one pebble. I hope that that's helpful. I'm not sure if that gets at your point, Taylor. I will tell you, and I'll just share, uh, scooping ice cream is not the, um, most glamorous of jobs, but I was taught from a very early age that when you're asked to do something, if you have responsibilities, you step up, you take care of those responsibilities. Um, I have done a lot of things that are not celebrated. I have done a lot of jobs that are people might look back and say, um, oh, I don't wanna be doing that. Um, when I came out of my um, um, graduate program as a um, uh, when I graduated with my bachelor's degree with art history and it was becoming clear to me that this was my path my first job was actually working in an office um, this was really interesting for me because I in the end like that position where I was just an administrator you know writing checks and balancing checkbooks and making sure that we were fulfilling our grant requirements my job there ended up opening for me as a museum curator the world of universal design. And that may not have been something I went into that thinking, but in retrospect, and as I was mentioning that reflection, that moment of reflection, I look back and I take great care in my curating to make sure that anybody coming into the gallery is gonna have a capacity to access the labels, to access the object, to experience the media thing, experience, whatever it is. And so all of these small things that you might, your path might take you to that may feel like they're, it may not feel like it's so evidently and obviously the path that you think you should be on. Well, what we know as humans is, and this is something Douglas Cardinal said one time and I, I got to witness, he said, what we know as humans fits in the palm of our hand over the course of a lifetime. But what exists in the universe is everything else reaching out into the stars. So we cannot act as if our own human 
knowledge is everything that we will need or everything that we must have. That's a huge statement to make, but it also, again, is like that bridge and just being the pebble. And so I paid for my house, I fed my children, I supported my husband, and I did all that working in an administrative office and I wasn't writing anything, but it contributed to my broader skill set. And so you just come to these various challenges that are set before you, you meet your responsibilities, you take care of your relationships, and whatever supports that may not be on the path of writing about art, or it may not be on the path of thinking about like existential comments, but it will be the path that you need and you have to find a way to be grateful in that process. Thank you. I think that's invaluable advice for all of us and especially students. We do have a couple of questions from the audience now. Scott Andrews would like to ask more about the vocabulary to discuss native art. Uh, Scott says, can you discuss keeping native art in conversation with the dominant culture art? And then mentions that you did invoke the term surrealism at one point. Um, and Scott comments, some of that vocabulary is useful and sometimes it's insufficient. Hmm. I would come back to those four core tenants and think about the fact that while the work that is yet to be done from my perspective, and there are so many people in this conversation on this, you know, on this call right now that I wish were here helping me to answer these questions, but I will say this, the language that exists um, is insufficient but it is something that we can interweave and make connections with. So it isn't my vision or my ambition to necessarily create, here's an indigenous worldview and here's a non-Western worldview and they should be kept apart. Um, as I mentioned, my thought is that we can build a bridge to this. So if surrealism helps someone to understand Lawrence um, Paul Yexwell Upton's painting, then so be it. Is it the vocabulary and the language that I want to rely on, I will not. Because I think that there are many, many more things in his work that are simply that is the baby talk that I was referencing, that these ideas that exist now in describing the isms and the, um, the, the um, you know, postmodernism. I think these things have run their course. And I'm not saying that there's not room for them in the future, but I think the things that are coming in the future and coming from the people who are working in the field now, um, that it will make us feel about these current language and vocabulary choices in the same way that we might think about primitivism. Like in a manner of speaking, it's a primitive form of thinking about indigenous art and we're ready to move beyond in the conversation. Thank you for that. I should say you're getting a lot of support in the chat about what a wonderful keynote you've given. And what oh, thank you. Are. Um, and we have quite a few questions here. I think it's a bit of a subject change, but uh, McColl, if that's how it's pronounced, McColl asked, what is the greatest challenge you face when dealing with non-native curators? Well, um, it's interesting because I actually don't have a lot of conflict with non-native curators. Um, the, that may be a product of where I am in the field that I um, have built significant network within the community broadly um, beyond just indigenous people, but broadly and people that I love and respect and value their input. Um, what I, find is that people are looking for a path forward. I often get asked how I can help other people to um, find a path upon which they can follow. And I think I tried to address that in my remarks is that there is a value and a necessity for community. Um, I don't find that I have a lot of challenges from non-native curators, um, certainly within my institution. I will say that I have had conflicts previously in other institutions. And I think that it takes a lot of patience, um, a lot of humility 
on my part and a lot of kindness to try to remember that my work is not secondary, nor is it subjected to other people's work or opinions. And in a manner of speaking, I often find myself being feeling um, very I find myself feeling like I want to be quite generous to those who can see their own work and their own world perspectives coming under criticism. Because I am not challenging other people to have, I am not challenging somebody who's working with contemporary, you know, um, art or, um, you know, Renaissance art to try and assume an indigenous approach. I am embracing the fact though that indigenous art deserves to be treated with indigenous principles. And so I'm not in competition with somebody. And I, I think generally speaking, me personally, I get a lot of requests from people who are trying to understand how to do better. And for those who might feel um, like my work inherently criticizes them, I try to be very patient and generous with them because that is not my intention. Thank you. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about some of your process then. So Fari asked, Heather, you talked all about the reading and research that you conduct. Do you suggest that others do the same? How much research is enough? And when do you actually begin to sit down and write? Well, the deadlines usually determine when I'm going to sit down and write. And I think anybody can be asked or expected to do the same, right? I mean, we all live by deadlines um, and, and that's where the trust that if you're doing your best, you just have to move forward, um, that you can't second guess yourself. There will always be things that you don't know. There are phenomenal extent of things that I don't know and I will never be conversant in and will never be able to do um, a better job with, but I can always just do my best. Um, I will say though that one of the things that I observed as a graduate student and as an undergraduate graduate student in art history and then in the multidisciplinary um, interdisciplinary degree that I pursued in my doctoral studies, how much the academy expects um, people who are interested in pursuing indigenous art to learn about everything else, but anybody can go to get a degree in any other field and be and think that they can come in and work with indigenous art without doing the same depth of readings. So there will always be more that you don't know. And I think that's a given and it should be expected and it should be expected humbly, right? But I do think that what we need is for people to pursue and extend themselves into fields for which they may not have been formally trained. And so um, if you're in I think there is some amazing indigenous writing happening in the American studies field um, and also um, in the anthropology field. Um, I think that there is amazing work in all of those things that are mutually informing. But again, the communities, the culture is the place where there is that um, often untapped resource. So I think you just have to do your best with that and, and pursue it doggedly. Yeah, nicely put. Uh, Brendan, I encourage you to jump in after this next question. Um, but while we're on the topic of sort of bringing up other disciplines, uh, Matthew asks, truly appreciates everything that you taught during your lecture and is wondering how your curatorial methodology might apply to other disciplines. Um, specifically, Matthew asked about Native American literature and maybe philosophy. <laughs> I think that it um, absolutely applies the curatorial methodology. I don't know. I think it could. I think that's the thing I was saying. I'm not really sure how this will work. I'm not sure how it will work in another field or, or other, um, even another person working with art. I'm not sure how it would work because we all bring our own truths to the experience. But I am very curious. And I do think that there is a need 
to bring these indigenous cultural tenants to these other fields. Um, the question was about the research methodology specifically, correct, Taylor? The curatorial methodology. The curatorial methodology. Well, I have been told by people that I was very shocked by that they felt like this was a, a methodology that could be adopted into other fields, absolutely. Um, because for how many fields has the idea of progress and success become bound up within the project or a grant project, you know, grant goal or the money. And we've lost our sense of our need to take care of our relationships and to work with respect for one another and to act with reciprocity, expecting that if you are asking something from someone that you are going to give them something in return. And it may not be a dollar for a dollar. It may be another kind of reciprocity. So I do think that there's a lot of benefit from that. And I think a lot of applicational um, exploration would benefit people who are indigenous or not indigenous. And I've been told that actually quite often by non-indigenous folks, that this is something that they really could embrace. And I, I'm encouraged by that. I do see Taylor that uh... Another question has, has come up um, from Jill. It's, I'll just read it uh, going forward. Heather, do you have any thoughts about moving this thought or practice or way of being to people um, at the levels, uh, so more administrative, directorial levels uh, of, of institutions, perhaps, or trustees? Um, 100%. Yes, yes. I actually think that if an institution wants to work in a and to decolonize themselves, that they have to intentionally and 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 actively engage in a conversation that works on those four core tenets of respect, reciprocity, responsibility, and relationship, and that it has to come from the top down and come from the bottom back up. In a manner of speaking, I have talked on um, in other opportunities about that the, you know, the sort of Western approach is that rectangular table with somebody standing at the end and everybody, the closer to that standing person, the more power you have and the farther away you are, the less power you have. And what really needs to happen is that these tables need to become circular so that there is a, you know, not to avoid the hierarchy because we all have the responsibilities that come with our positions, but to create an opportunity for voice and exchange and evaluation of all the roles that people have and, th and, and the original thinking that can come from people who might be lower down on the um, hierarchy than those who are you know, higher up. But I, and, and, and moreover, if an institution owns and cares for indigenous materials, as I mentioned, building those relationships within your local indigenous community are critical and the curator or collections manager or educator cannot be the sole person representing the whole institution they have to be built in such a way that the board members are building relationships within the tribal leadership that there have been we've i've been on a couple of advisory panels and we've encouraged that there might even be a dedicated position or seat on a board for the representatives the leadership of the local indigenous community to hold space and power in that place to benefit those relationships. And by extending this, then you no longer have like a frail single line between the institution and the tribal indigenous community. You start to build a fabric, a fabric of communication, a fabric of support, and that is all mutual. That is all incredibly mutual but it requires an above and below uh, approach to that. Yeah, while we're on the topic of power structures, uh, Andrea Carlson asked, there are a number of native artists who want their works to be categorized as American art. What do you think of these categorizations? Mm. <laughs> I would agree that the categories are restrictive and misinformed often within institutions. And I, I don't have a proposal yet um, of a clear answer, but Andrea, who is um, 
an amazing artist and thinker. Um, what I would like to suggest is that I think that there's the potential of creating um, more like Venn diagrams between various collections so that one might be able to identify an object as both indigenous, as both um, maybe even tribally specific indigenous, um, and but also American as part of the national scheme, as part of a North American collection, that these um, sort of categorical restrictions are less productive than and less less helpful than I think that they have originally been built to support. And I think there's a lot of work to do with that. And I look forward, I hope it happens in my lifetime. I look forward to seeing that kind of change happen. Great. There's another question that came up in the chat uh, that I, I thought would be interesting, uh, especially in, in as it pertains to those who are actively curating or developing a curatorial practice, but also a writing practice. And that has to do with the audience. And uh, when you're doing your research or, or your curatorial work, uh, your administrative work and, and, and your writing, uh, whom are you writing to or whom are you seeking to communicate with? That's a great question. And I think um, what I can tell you is it's not a single audience. There's always this idea that you can put a you know name to what who um, who you're writing for and and who you're curating for. When I'm writing, I try to use language that is accessible because I really um, I I always kind of giggle when people tell me I'm quite academic because I don't think so, um, and largely because I write in a way that I am trying to entertain my grandmother. She passed away when I was 14, but she was an incredibly smart, beautiful woman who um, was very curious and interested in the world. And so I try to write for her um, in the way that anybody else might be able to come into it with that same sense of curiosity without maybe having such a deep sort of um, academic um, references upon which to, you know, uh, rely. But I also think that I am writing to represent and honor and inspire the Indigenous community through my work. And I always think about the fact that I cannot write in a vacuum and not expect that I am being watched as a way of speaking um, for what I'm saying. And so I'm thinking constantly of that. But I'm also trying to communicate and build that bridge with a non-Indigenous community. And so those are the three points that I keep at the top of my head when I'm writing. Um, yes. Yeah, we just got a question that I think fits exactly with what we're talking about, which is when you're talking about writing for Indigenous communities, how are you sort of defining and thinking about indigenous and, and specifically, what about relationships to indigenous art globally? Uh, do you write for the America specifically or do you consider yourself to write in solidarity with indigenous artists globally? And I think both of those things can be true. I only can write about indigenous American art and not, you know, I say that that's such a broad statement. I mean, who can say that they can speak to and represent such a broad scope of thinking and cultures and languages. Um, but I do try to try to be very respectful in um, thinking, not just of my own community, I think of sort of multi sided work. Um, I think of the market, the museums, that's where my work is, that's my focus. Um, but also um, community based in doing that. And from thinking about where I'm at and where my responsibilities are, I start there, but I try to contribute to a national and you know, continental dialogue. I think that's something that I'm very conscious of. Uh, recognizing though, that as I mentioned in my, my speaking notes, um, these relationships extend, extend beyond that. I have a great respect for so many of the great thinkers that are getting published out of New Zealand and I'm, so honored to you know, periodically have an opportunity to have um, either share a panel or share a um, dialogue publicly. 
but those relationships and conversations do go on and whether or not they're public or not, um, those are part of the thinking and recognizing that if I am doing well locally, I believe that that benefit will have global implications. Yeah, I think we have uh, time for one more question and then we'll go to break and we can keep having a conversation. And Brendan, do you wanna combine a couple of these we still have in the chat? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, where are... Okay, so Matt has asked, okay, this is interesting. Um, the question of low and high art is often limited uh, has often limited American Indian artists uh, is where he starts out. And previous generations of ind indigenous artists had to hide their, their heritage to be considered um, as artists. And um, I'm sorry, Taylor. That, okay, I'm, I apologize. I wanted to get a grasp of the, the question before um, sharing it. So the question here is asking, with the need to hide indigeneity that may have influenced a lot of the earlier generations of artists, how does that sort of get carried forward and how, how can we deal with that in, in letting indigeneity become an important part of or a proud part of an artist's practice. Hmm. Well, that question um, assumes a Western Euro-American perspective of the high and low, which I really, um, to be perfectly honest, I don't really bother that much with that. Um, I think that those, uh, definitions of high and low art, fine art versus craft. Um, these have never been something I felt comfortable with and they were so clearly racial, uh, racialized um, judgments that were made on cultural production and artistic and creative endeavors that um, I simply have not um, really adopted them in order to even think about them. So I'm gonna say that. As far as like, yes, there have been periods historically when artists would get put into a caveat. And, and I have heard contemporary artists, native artists, who um, bemoan the categorization of being an indigenous artist versus you know a native artist versus a contemporary artist. And the things that I think about that are, and, and they're very brief, is that there are advantages to both and there are disadvantages to both. Um, and so while there are artists who may have been historically identified or categorized as a contemporary artist and their cultural descendancy and heritage um, when accurately, um, um, you know, part of their identity were dismissed or hidden, um, I fodder, right? Like there's just all kinds of opportunity for us to go back and, look at art and think about them as Indigenous artists. I mean, I think this of George Morrison, who for so often was seen as just this abstract painter. But then when you start looking at his art, and if you've ever been to Minnesota, I mean, this is where that relationship to places and that red horizon line that he has, that just forever just anchors his work to the space and the horizon in Minnesota. He never left Minnesota. He just found a vocabulary that worked for him. You know, those categorizations, they're really relevant to people outside of my thinking. Um, and I'm not sure I have much to say, except that anyone who didn't get embraced or um, actively publicly embrace themselves as their indigenous community um, in order to make success, nobody's going to judge them. And I don't think there's any judgments to be made, but there might be a lot of opportunities to go back and reconsider their art. Um, and I think now for the native artists who think that there are some significant advantages to being in the creative community, not recognized as a native artist, they have to also understand that's a much bigger pool and the competition in that pool is um, um, difficult. 
Um, but it still can, there is, it is still absolutely possible to have success in that field. And it may be, it comes with bigger rewards, but it is still nevertheless a bigger pool to be competing in. I hope that helps answer that. I'm not sure, Brandon, if I did that. I really, it's, um, this is why these forums are so powerful and so helpful. And so I want to thank you uh, for your, your comments and your response.